Good morning, church. How are we? You guys good? Happy Mom's Day, moms. How many moms are in the house? Yeah? You guys are awesome. Would you guys stand for a second? I'm going to make you do something super funky and make you feel really awkward. Um, this last week, my wife was gone for four days, and so I have more of an appreciation for you than ever before in my life. <laughs> Five loads of laundry, packing lunches, driving kids to school, picking it. It was insane. I was like, how in the world does my wife do this every single day? It's awesome. So I just want to thank you guys. And uh, if you guys are around a mom, uh, would you guys just reach your hand out, and we're going to pray over the moms in this place this morning. Jesus, we thank you uh, for these moms that give up so much of themselves, God, to invest their lives into their kids, to serve uh, their husbands and their homes. God, what, what an amazing call. And I just pray today, Jesus, that they would feel appreciated and encouraged, God, that you would be the one to fill them up, God, to give them joy and give them peace and patience, God, and compassion. God, that you would um, continue to just invest into them as they invest into others. Lord, as they squeeze themselves out, God, I pray that you would just continue to refill them. Lord, we've, we thank you so much for their lives. God, I pray today would truly be a blessing. Show us how we can best support and love and encourage and uh, just thank our moms and our wives today, God. We just thank you for their life in your name. Amen. Thank you, moms, for all that you do. You guys excited to be here? Yeah? Um, I want to welcome you guys if it's your first time here. Uh, my name's Chris. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and we are really, really glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we've been in this series that we started last week called All About Jesus, and um, basically, if you're new with us, you, if you're not new with us, you, you heard the beginning of it last week, and we're mapping out the next, um, the, well, this week and next week, and um, this series is basically our mission statement, who we are, where we're headed, what are we about, what's the culture of Anthem, what do we stand for, and so last week we talked about being all about Jesus. What does this actually mean? If that's our mission, to be all about Jesus, what does that actually mean? And um, last week we talked about what it meant, again, to be all about Jesus and how so many people use that verbiage and perhaps they don't even uh, understand what it actually means to be all about Jesus uh, and we discussed this idea that in order for us to understand what it means to be all about Jesus, that we actually need to know what in the heck Jesus was all about. Like, we can't be all about him if we don't know what Jesus stood for. Um, and, and we talked about who and what the church is, and that the, the church is the body uh, of Christ, and it's a body of people that are empowered by the Holy Spirit, um, endeavoring to live an unabridged lifestyle that allows for Jesus to be integrated into every part of our life. Now, you saw that video at the beginning. What I love most about that video is that it kind of shows different aspects of life, and that's what we want to be known for is the fact that we don't, we aren't just Christians that come to a church service on Sunday mornings. Um, we don't just worship when we come here and lift our hands um, to three or four songs at a worship gathering. But we are Christians, we are followers of Jesus in every aspect of our life, whether that be working, uh, playing, whether that be school, uh, family, friends. I mean, we, we take Jesus with us everywhere we go. He's integrated into every aspect of our life. And we discussed last week what it meant to live a life free from the compartmentalization of our faith and our life. Um, and allowing Jesus to permeate again in all aspects of our life. So we landed at this mission statement last week that we talked about, which is just all about Jesus. It sounds super simple, and we like it that way. We don't want some elaborate mission statement because we just simply want to be about Christ. So this week we're going to discuss our culture. So beings that we're all about Jesus, how is it, what is the vehicle that we're actually going to be taking to becoming all about Jesus? So knowing that, that we want to be all about Jesus, what are the cultural distinctives for Anthem Friends Church that are going to make us all about Jesus. Uh, in the Lori household, Heather and I pray that our family would love and serve Jesus. We want to not only honor God in our individual lives, but we want to honor God in our marriage, and we want to honor God by empowering and investing in, loving on, supporting, encouraging, um, equipping the little ones that he's put in our home. We want them to be servants of the Most High God as well. So that's our call in the Lori household. So even though the goal is to love and to serve Jesus in the Lori home, um, there are going to be things that are unique to the Lori family with how uh, we live into that mission, how we actually do that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple different 
um, usages of the word culture this morning, and so I want you to imagine two rings. One ring would be culture as in America, right? So sometimes we refer, we refer to culture, and what we're saying is the American culture, like in the U.S., this is how it is. Now, there's also another ring that we're going to be talking about this morning, which is the church. Like, who is the church, and how is the church impacting the American culture? Um, so it's much like Jesus was impacting the Jewish culture, right? There was the big ring of the Jewish culture, and Jesus came to empower, to release, to equip the church um, to impact the culture, to, to change, bring change to the culture, and to really to flip the culture upside down. So there's these two rings. There's American culture, and then we've got our church culture. And before we dive into some of these distinctives that are the culture of Anthem, um, I want to talk about what culture is and why culture is important to us. Uh, what is culture? For, for some of you that love kombucha and water kefir, anybody? You guys know what culture is, right? Live culture? Yeah? That's not the culture we're talking about this morning. Um, we're talking about culture as in reference to the way of life of a group of people. Um, it's our behaviors, our beliefs. It's what we value. Culture is communicated and culture is imitated. And this means that culture isn't something that's just picked up. You don't just get it. It actually has to be communicated. It's something that's intentionally communicated uh, in order that the distinctives, the behaviors, the beliefs, and the values that make up that culture would actually be Im imitated and actually lived into. Um, so I'm going to kind of preach differently than I, I normally do because we're going to go through a text here and we're going to talk about it. And at the end, I'm just going to run through eight different cultural distinctives for our church. And we've been working on these for about a year and finally landed at these eight distinctives. And we want to share them with you guys. We want not only for our church to be about Jesus, but we want to know like what it is we're being called to. What does the culture of Anthem look like? What do we value? What are our behaviors? Um, what are our beliefs? Again, our, our, our culture. So there's this old adage that says that culture eats strategy for lunch. Has anybody ever heard that before? Anybody in the business world, you've ever heard that? Culture eats strategy for lunch. Uh, meaning culture isn't something that's just picked up. It's taught. Uh, it's shared. And it's reiterated. For instance, you can't really say you're all about Jesus without being able to define what that means and then prayerfully consider the parameters that you'll set up in your life to help you keep on the straight and narrow to be about Jesus. You have to establish those parameters in your life. And if being all about Jesus in our life is, is a great stake, anybody like a good stake? Okay, if, if being all about Jesus is the great stake, it's, it's what we're aspiring to become, it's what we want to be, then the culture is the plate that the stake is served on. Um, so have you ever been to, or have you ever anticipated going to a restaurant to have a really good dinner? Anybody? Yeah? Some of you? The rest of you don't eat? Um, but have you ever had a moment before where you've anticipated going to this, this restaurant to have this amazing dinner, only to find out when you get there the customer service stinks, the place is dirty, uh, the plate's half cracked and has dirt all over it, and then the great meal sits on top of this disgusting plate. Anybody ever been there before? You've been in truck stops around the U.S. before then, right? <laughs> I've eaten in a lot of those on the road, and I'm telling you, like, I've had some great meals at some very disgusting joints. Um, but... Like I said, the culture, if Jesus, being all about Jesus is the steak, then, then the, the plate that it's served on is this culture. And if our mission as a church is to be all about Jesus, then we want to put some time, some thought into how, um, into how God has asked us as a family to present Jesus to the world. Uh, I love how Jesus did two, two things in his life, and he created this countercultural movement um, in the Jewish culture of his day. One thing that Jesus did was Jesus would communicate his mission. He, he would verbalize it and communicate it over and over and over again. But then the second part is that Jesus actually modeled what it is he shared. So what do, what do people accuse the church of being? More often than not, hypocrites, right? And what's a hypocrite? It's an actor. It's somebody who's faking it. Like they say it, but they don't actually do it. Like they put on a good face. And, and Jesus was the 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 perfect, um, the, the perfect uh, representation of, of truth. And Jesus not only communicated the mission over and over and over again, but Jesus lived into it. Jesus modeled it. Jesus took what started as a ragtag group of guys, these 12 disciples who were maybe like in their late teens and early 20s, um, and he told them to follow him, right? 
And Jesus paved the way and showed them what it looked like to live an unabridged life for the glory of God. Jesus didn't show up on the scene and then become convinced by the Jewish culture of all the things that he needed to change and all the things that he needed to become, but Jesus actually showed up unexpectedly, and he began to shape and influence and change uh, a culture that was very set in their way. And we as a church want to be like Jesus in the sense that we are empowered by Jesus to change the culture that we live in and not be changed by the culture that we live in. And it will be, the enemy will fight over, over time to convince you that you need to become more and more like the culture you're surrounded by when really what you need to be more like is Jesus and then allow him to move through you to influence the culture around you. Uh, we're these agents of change that Jesus has literally placed for such a time as this in Kootenai County in order that we influence the culture and not be influenced by it. I heard it said that, the, the, that most of the world are thermometers. I don't know if you guys have heard this. And that people like a thermometer just reflect the climate of their culture. So they become like their cult, the culture. They're chameleons. Um, but, but this was not the case with Jesus. This is not what God has called us to. Jesus called us to actually be thermostats. And thermostats actually regulate the climate of their surroundings, not the other way around. Thermostats bring change. And Jesus was this thermostat. He, he started a countercultural movement that went against much of what Jewish culture stood for. Jesus turned the culture upside down by standing upon truth. Uh, if you guys would open with me to Matthew chapter 9, we're going to be in verses 1 through 17. Would you guys say word when you get there? You guys with me? Am I talking too fast? You tracking? Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. Um, I want to look at a section of scripture where we see Jesus actually changing the culture and not being changed by it, even though he's got pressures coming from all sides of him to become more and more like the culture. Verse 1. You guys there? If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seats in front of you. Verse 1. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea, and, it came, and he came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. So stop right there. So these first two verses, what do these two verses say about Jesus? That, what does it say about the fact that people were bringing the sick to Jesus? Um, it, it says, one, that, that Jesus had the ability to do something that nobody else could. There was something about Jesus that nobody else could had. And so they were bringing the sick to him. It said that even though the culture would, would have completely outcast this man, this paralytic, for his condition, Jesus actually had compassion for this man. It said that Jesus loved and accepted the outcasts. So Jesus could do something that nobody else could. Jesus had compassion and love for the outcasts. Um, are, are there people in your lives that are bringing others to you because we do the same? I mean, are people coming in droves, lining up, bringing the sick to the church to get healing? How many people are bringing the sick to you guys on a regular basis? How many people are bringing the outcasts to us, to the church, to the followers of Jesus? How many people expect the church to be a, a people full of compassion and love and actually find something completely different once they engage professed followers of Jesus? There's not many people doing this, lining up to bring the outcasts and the sick to get healing and to be accepted because the church has spent way too much time telling people how messed up they are. And, and, and the church has spent too much time saying one thing and doing another, right? Being the hypocrite. We say it, but we don't actually move on it. And what Jesus said, Jesus did. Jesus modeled what he communicated. Verse 3, and some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? I love that. Jesus reads their mail, right? Jesus, it says, knowing their thoughts. Jesus says, what are you, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Oh, man, like pierced straight to the heart, right? Which is easier to say, your sins, are for, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Both of which sound pretty hard to me, right? To forgive somebody of their sins and to heal them, um, of their sickness or their disease. It sounds pretty difficult. It says in verse 6, but so that, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said uh, to this paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. 
and he got up and he went home. Jesus didn't just say, be healed. Um, though, though that was the outcome of the scenario, what did Jesus say first? Your sins are forgiven. What was Jesus going after first? This man's heart. Jesus' intentions here were, were really twofold. Um, one, for this boy's heart to be completely transformed, to, for it to be renewed, um, and, and to heal him. But also, Jesus, the other portion of Jesus' message was that he wanted to send a message to those religious standing around, believing that Jesus wasn't who he said he was. And, and to those, Jesus didn't just use words to convince them, but Jesus prompted action. So Jesus sent a message to their culture that he was powerful enough to do three things that nobody in their religious culture could do. One, have compassion for the downtrodden versus ride them off like everybody else had done. Two, heal the sick and tell them to get up and walk. Nobody else had the power and the authority to do that. And three, the most important of them all is what? Forgiveness of their sins. Why were people bringing people to Jesus? Because they knew Jesus could do things and he had power and authority that nobody else had. And they trusted him, so they would bring people to him in the droves. And it says, but when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to who? To who? Men. It says, but when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Who, who are the men that he's referring to? You and I. That God had given power and authority to you and I to function like Jesus had functioned. To have the same power and authority that God bestowed upon Jesus, that it would be given to you and I, that we could heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. And Jesus often used physical miracles to actually prompt spiritual renewal. That's what Jesus was after. He was after spiritual renewal, the complete transformation of the heart. And what happened when people heard Jesus speak and saw and saw Jesus move. What happened? What was the result of that? It says that people worshiped the God who sent Jesus. So what's the goal for us as the church? That, that people would actually come to us thinking, you guys function in a power and, a, and an authority that nobody else does. What is it about you guys? And that we point people to Jesus. Why? Um, we, why, why do we pray for them? Why do we love the downtrodden and, and, and accept the sinners and bring them in and, and love on them and, and bestow grace upon grace upon them like Jesus has done? Why do we do all these things? Because we want people to worship the God who sent Jesus, the one who died on the cross for our sins, the one who bestowed grace and forgiveness and mercy um, upon you and I. We want people to engage that God. Verse 9 it says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew. Now get this. He's sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he says to him, follow me, and he gets up and follow him. Doesn't that sound crazy? Jesus just shows up. This dude's sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he says, hey, bro, follow me. And Matthew goes, cool, I'm in. You know, like, let's do this thing, and he's all in. And then it says, then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and the sinners? Why is he hanging out with those people? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but it's those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. He says, I desire compassion. Some of your translations say mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus changed the culture by calling a ragtag group of young men out to follow him. He transformed a culture through a handful of ragtag guys that were all in. And I pray that we would do the same, church, that, that, that we would call people out to follow after Jesus, to leave their lives of comfortability, to step into the unknown and seek, seek Jesus with all they have. Jesus ate with the tax collectors and the sinners, and who was frustrated by this? The Pharisees, right? The religious, those that did all the right things but whose lives bore no fruit. That sounds a lot like uh, the American church to me. People who do a lot of the right things who live, whose lives bear zero fruit. 
So we chalk it up to the fact that hopefully if I do all this stuff, something's going to come forth from my life. And Jesus is standing in the midst, he's hanging out with these tax collectors and these sinners, and the Pharisees are watching this going on, and the Pharisees are going, are you kidding me? He's hanging out with, having love and compassion for the sinners and the tax collectors? Like, are you serious? And the Pharisees get frustrated, and Jesus makes a statement that it's not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. And what did Jesus mean when he said this? That you can't help those who think that they don't need help. Zero repentance. You can't help those that won't turn and repent and give their lives to Jesus. Two, you can't take care of those who think that they can take care of themselves, that are prideful enough to believe that by the things they do, they can conjure up this good life and make things happen on their own. You can't take care of those people. And the Pharisees were worried about this man, Jesus, who was turning their culture upside down. They were so frustrated because Jesus came in doing things a completely different way, coming in the power and the authority of the Most High God, and they're freaking out. Because what they're seeing is not somebody who just comes on the scene and, and, and says he's going to heal people or prays over a guy like, um, you know, do you want to be healed? Yes, well, let's pray, and then nothing happens. But this man who moves in the power and the authority of God, when he prays for people, they're actually healed. And more than that, he's able to grant them the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus wasn't just all talk, but he actually lived it out. And I think that probably scared the Pharisees more than anything else, to see Jesus' influence rising while their influence was shrinking that they were losing control because Christ was gaining it. And some of this was due to the fact that Jesus preached this message of compassion and grace and love that actually drove us to sacrifice in our lives, while the Pharisees preached a message of making sacrifice to earn compassion and love. So for the Pharisees to see a group of undeserving sinners receiving compassion um, amidst their sin without doing anything to earn it, it infuriated them. Because in the Pharisees' eyes, we do all the right things, and so we deserve your love and your compassion. And what Jesus was doing was granting love and compassion in order that that would lead to laying down our lives, dying to ourselves, sacrificing our lives in order to be renewed and gain life from Christ. He says in verse 14, then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. We know that Jesus is going to die on a cross, he's going to be resurrected again, and then he's going to ascend to heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. That Jesus is eventually going to leave this earth, and they're going to be left with his Holy Spirit. And at this point, what he's saying is that there's going to be a day that will come when the bridegroom is taken from them and they're going to have to fast because that's what it means to be desperate for Jesus to seek him. Verse 16, but no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined but they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and then both are preserved. Jesus knew that he couldn't come and just incorporate some of these cultural shifts into the existing Jewish culture. It, it would have been like putting new wine into an old wineskin or a new patch on an old garment. And so Jesus encouraged complete, uh, like a complete cultural shift of sorts, knowing that he had to bring reformation to their culture and not just try to incorporate into an existing method. Jesus wasn't about going like, oh, this is the way you guys do things? Okay, like, well, let's see if I can incorporate some things into this and just kind of be a chameleon and work my way into your culture. Jesus came in and flipped the whole thing upside down. Why? Because he was God. He was making himself known. He was the only way to, to forgiveness and to new life. And so Jesus comes in and he, he flips it all upside down. And this is similar, actually, to where we find ourselves in our culture today, where the churches began to reflect the culture more than be a reflection of Jesus in order to, be, to provide change for the culture. Like the church and followers of Jesus have been more influenced by the culture around us, the American culture, than we have being, been influencers of that culture to bring change 
so that Jesus can be made known in the American culture. And with our political climate right now, how many of you guys just hate watching TV or listen to the radio? It's just crazy, right? And we don't need to preach a message encouraging the legislation of morality in the political world. We need to be the church. We need to practice what we preach. We're raised in a society that, that has told us that, um, that things work from the top down. And so if you want to actually influence change, then you start at the top and then it trickles down into everybody else. That's what we're taught in the American culture. Yet Jesus influenced change through a ragtag small group of 12 normal young adults. Did Jesus work from the top down? No way. Jesus started at the bottom and he influenced change. He flipped the culture upside down through 12 men that were willing to leave everything behind to, to follow after Jesus. And it almost seems backwards compared to the, to the way that we assume change is actually driven in our society. But what is it that will actually change our culture? One, it's biblical teaching. All of the Bible, not parts of it, all of it. It's studying it. It's knowing the word of God. It's falling in love with Jesus. It's a, a culture not built on a man or a figurehead other than Jesus. Like it can only be grounded on him. And us plain Jane, North Idaho folk up in Coeur d'Alene, us Jesus lovers up here, it's, it's us actually moving on and acting on our faith. Like, it's, it's just the normal people deciding to follow Jesus with all that they have to be all about Jesus that, that actually influences the culture and flips the culture upside down. But yet most of the church stands around and goes like, oh God, you know, if you just change leadership, then it'll influence everybody else. And what we do is take the onus off of us to actually be the church to influence change in our culture. And it's wrong. You've been granted all power and authority from heaven to be the church, to bring healing to our land through the, the blood of Christ. Like, we have to step up and be the church. And if Jesus flipped a culture upside down through 12 young guys, then it's not going to take a change in the leadership of our country to cause renewal and revival in the hearts of people. It's going to start with you. And it's going to take genuine followers of Jesus actually knowing who and what they are for and then being willing to obey God when he says go. So I want to run you guys through eight different what we would consider cultural distinctives of our church. And like I said, we've been working on the, this list for about a year, praying through it, cutting things out, like really wanting to know where God was leading us. And so um, these eight cultural distinctives are who we want to say anthem, like what we're about, who we're about. Um, what does it look like to be part of this culture? The first one is that um, we're a movement, and I know that this word is an extremely loaded word, um, but what I love most about it is that it signifies community, that, that it's a group of people that have something in common that are actually being moved to action. And, and so every move of God in history is stemmed actually from community, a group of people rallied around the cause of Christ to influence change, to move together. Everybody wants to belong to something, to be connected to something bigger than themselves, and Christ has offered us that opportunity. So the, the, the statement is that we're a movement, and then I want to read you guys, as I go through these statements, I'll read you guys kind of um, like our, our, our copy for each of those statements. So we're a movement. Jesus didn't lead a congregation. Jesus led a movement. Jesus called people to leave everything behind to follow him, which meant intentionally walking away from a comfortable place where they could have stayed forever in order to step into the unknown, a life full of passion and obedience, transformation, and the miraculous. At times, it can seem as though today's church has become more of a museum than a movement. We're praying that Jesus would lead us in equipping people to be participants in this movement, not as mere spectators seeking entertainment. This movement might appear to be casual in style, but it's fierce in action, focusing on the inside instead of what we see on the out. So the first point is that we're a movement. The second is that we're seeking Jesus. We're a movement seeking Jesus. First and foremost, he is what we're about. Um, we want to worship and have reverence for and honor God through this movement. Uh, we, also, we often label worship as something we come to do on a Sunday morning when we sing songs and lift our hands in praise, right? Right? But worship is this lifestyle, and we want to condone a lifestyle of worship, not just a, like a, a couple songs that you come sing on a Sunday morning. Uh, in the Psalms, I love how you read the psalmist. He, he continues to say, like, um, like, refers to bowing down in worship, um, falling to his knees, and there's this humility in that, 
that I think needs to exist in the church where we come to worship and in the presence of God, we bow to our knees in reverence of Jesus because he's so amazing. And when I think of seeking Jesus, I think of people who are humble enough to bow in order to praise. I I love that, to bow to praise, to recognize their place as servants of the Most High God and to revere the name of Jesus. And our statement on this is that we are the askers, the seekers, and those who knock endlessly pursuing more of Jesus, all of Jesus. We lay aside lesser pursuits in order to obtain the one true prize. So we're a movement seeking Jesus. The third is that we're serving others. Um, Jesus set his preferences aside in order to focus on the needs of those around him. Jesus, though, though deserving to be served himself, actually chose to serve others and wash the feet of those around him. And he did this primarily to model for you and I what it looked like to love your neighbor to lay down your life for somebody else, to serve those around you. And um, our, our copy for that, that, that portion is that Jesus poured out his life in service to others 24-7, 365. No compartmentalization here. He lived and breathed service. He still does. We aspire to serve as earnestly and as endlessly as Jesus has served us. We view service as an act of worship, a lifestyle, not as an optional extra. The fourth point is that we're keeping it real. Uh, So we're a movement seeking Jesus, serving others, keeping it real. And we can't be real without realizing who our identity is in. If you don't know who you are in Christ's eyes, it's very difficult to be transparent, to be real, to be honest. And transparency can't happen if we're afraid to confess our sins to one another and to repent from those. Jesus encouraged and modeled a life of honesty, vulnerability, and transparency. He also disdained lives of hypocrisy and pretense. As followers of Jesus, we know that embracing and confessing our brokenness is crucial to a life of authenticity. We want to be known for keeping it real in our lives, in our relationships, in our community, and in how we worship. No hype, no frills, no gimmicks, always only Jesus. So a movement seeking Jesus, serving others, keeping it real. The fifth one is embracing change. Jesus empowered this culture of change. Um, Jesus following is a risky business. Would you guys say that? Yeah? It's risky. How many of you guys that gave your life to Christ, like you dove into the unknown, like you lost control of your life and you gave it to Jesus and it was risky. Jesus following is a risky business. When we choose to walk by faith and not by sight, we will make waves, but it's to the waves that Jesus is calling us. It has been said that our God is good, but not necessarily safe. As we continue to follow Jesus into the unknown, we recognize that we must embrace change and that obedience to him is more important than our comfort or perceived success. We don't simply change for the sake of change itself, but for the sake of Jesus. So a movement seeking Jesus, serving others, keeping it real, embracing change. The sixth one is valuing all generations. One of the things I love most about our church, you guys, is the diversity in the generations that exist here. There's very few places that you go where you see an 18-year-old and an 80-year-old worshiping Jesus together in one place. It's an amazing sight, and and, and we're truly gifted to, uh, like, blessed to have um, such a diverse group here. But uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I bought a motorcycle that was in pieces. And, um, and so I've been working on building this motorcycle, and it's literally all in pieces. And uh, we, when I bought it, there was a bolt broke off inside the engine case. And so um, we thought we'd like drill into the bolt and then use an easy out to get the bolt out of the engine case. Anybody ever done that before? Did it work for you? Um, as we put this easy out in, the easy out broke off inside of the bolt. And so now we had an easy out broke off inside of a bolt inside of the engine case, which is apparently like a no bueno situation, right? And so I start calling around to different machine shops in town trying to figure out, find out if there's somebody that can fix this thing for me. And so the first shop I go to is this group of young guys. They're like my age, right? The guy comes out, looks at my engine. He's like, oh man, you know, I don't think we want to even try that. You know, like that's, that's, you know, you might be better off buying a new engine because it's going to take us a lot of time to get that thing fixed, and, and there's too much potential to mess it up. And, and I said, really, you can't fix it? He's like, well, let me go get some other guys. At one point, he had five guys from inside the shop all standing around my engine going like, no, nah, dude, I don't think we can do this. And so I leave, call my wife. I'm all discouraged. I'm like, 
they said they can't fix it, you know? What am I going to do? And, and so I, I end up calling this other machine shop, and the guy goes, bring it down. Let me take a look at it. I show up. 75-year-old man walks out, looks at my engine. He's like, will you help me carry this in? I said, sure. So we carry it in, set it on a sawhorse. The guy goes, why don't you leave for 30 minutes, and I'll call you. I said, all right. And so I leave. 30 minutes later, the guy calls me. He's like, all right, it's fixed. You can come back and get it. I'm like, what? So, like, so... I go back, and I'm like so thankful. I'm like, man, you don't know how much this means to me. You know, I'm crying over an engine. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, it was 40 bucks. You know, I'm like, this is awesome. You did it in a half an hour. How did you do it? And the guy said, oh, it's easy. I just took, and he shows me he has this metal rod with a lever on it, and he welded it to the old bolt, and he backed it out. And I'm like, why couldn't the young guys do this? You know what I mean? Like, you guys need to hang out together more and teach them some tips of the trade. They want to use all their electronic gadgets to try to get a bolt out, and you just, like, weld the lever to it. You know what I mean? But I realized in that moment, like, the value of the generations. The, 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 the younger need the older to show them some of the tricks of the trade. They've been where you're going. Like, you need to, to come alongside of some of the older, and the older need to come alongside some of the younger. And you older, like, how many of you know about Instagram and Facebook? You don't know anything about it. You need the younger, right? You got to, how do I do posts? How do I, like, put pictures up? How do I get more followers, right? You guys are all wanting that, aren't you, to become Insta-famous? But the generations need each other. Like, we need each other. The old need the young, and the young need the old. And we need to figure out how to wrestle through our differences in order to get to a place where Jesus is the common bond. He's the one that brings unity, and we learn how to do this together with one another. So we value the generations. Our lives are an anthem of praise to our great God. This isn't a solo act, but a medley of praise. We value diversity in the body of anthem. We, fi we fight to add more voices, different voices, into the chorus. We long for a more full expression of praise to rise to our king, knowing that our differences aren't liabilities, but they're strengths. Uh, number seven, keeping it simple. So we're a movement seeking Jesus, serving others, keeping it real, embracing change, valuing all generations, keeping it simple. Jesus engaged a cluttered, sort of spiritual hoarded culture in the Jewish culture, right? They're like spiritually hoarding, not sharing with anybody else. And Jesus engaged this culture and he brought simplicity. And, and we, we want to let go of the good things in order to pick up the things that are best, and being spread so thin has really been the M.O., I think, of the American church for a long time. And hence, in some regards, doing a ton has kept the church from actually doing what's right. So we do a bunch, but we're not actually doing what God has called us to do. We're just doing a bunch of stuff. Um, we said Jesus kept it simple. He didn't get bogged down with events, programs, and competing vision. He kept his eyes on the prize, and we want to do that too. We have one goal, to love Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We will not sacrifice this single pursuit, nor will we water it down with extras. It's simply always only Jesus, and that's it. Uh, I hate Cheesecake Factory because the menu is so crazy, right? We don't want to recreate that in the church and give you a thousand things to choose from because you end up getting confused and there's so much stuff to do that we don't actually focus on the things that we should be focusing on. We should be just focusing on Christ and equipping the church to do the works of ministry, not creating a bunch of gatherings in the church for people to do stuff with one another. Church isn't a social club. It's a movement. Um, the, yesterday I was at this birthday party for a kid in our church and they did this paper mache balloon. Uh, for a pinata. Anybody ever built a pinata like that? And so my kids were standing there with me, and the kid whose birthday was, he gets out there, and he's hitting away, and he hits this thing, and the candy goes everywhere. And then I watch all these little kids, like ages like three to um, maybe like 13 or 14, go flocking for this candy. And I'm just watching this take place. It's just an insanity, right? And uh, it's just like they're punching and kicking, and no. And uh, I'm watching my son, my youngest, Jonah, pick up one piece of candy at a time and put it in a bag. And I'm thinking like, bud, you know, that's not very efficient. You know, you have two hands. Like, God gave you two hands. Take as much as you can, you know? And, and then the older kid is taking like grips of them. Like, my oldest one is just like, like stacking up candy in there. And, and so I'm watching this happen, and I'm thinking, like, what happens in life that we, at one point in our life, we were okay with simplicity and grabbing one thing, and we were totally content with that. 
And what happens is we get older, and then all of a sudden we think, well, God gave me two hands, and they're big, and I should just take what I can. I deserve it. And we have this entitlement thing going on as we get older. And, and so we get in the car, and we're driving away. And just to reiterate my point, my, my oldest son from the back of the car goes, Dad, did you see how much candy Jonah has in his bag? And I said, no. Does he have a lot? And he said, no, he has like five pieces. And I said, oh, how much do you have? And he holds up this massive bag full of candy. And I'm like, you know, we, we are so greedy as Christians. Like, we can't be content with just Jesus, that we need all these things that serve us and do for us, and, and that Christ in and of himself is not enough for us. And so we gain this, this sense of entitlement that I'm entitled to it. I need it. Like, the church has to put together all these programs to do things for me, and blah, 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 blah. Instead of realizing at one point in your life when you gave your life to Jesus, you were totally content with a couple pieces. You were con totally tent with, content with it only being about Jesus and not needing all the other frills and the gimmicks. And so we want to keep it simple. And then the last one is that we give because he gave to us. So we're a movement seeking Jesus, serving others, keeping it real, embracing change, valuing all generations, keeping it simple, and giving because he gave to us. Jesus said that it's better to give than to receive, and nobody knows more about giving than Jesus. We desire to live and give as graciously and generously as Jesus has given to us. We view our lives and resources not as our own, but his. We hold on to Jesus and we release all else. We give because he gave. We forgive because we are forgiven. We love because we are loved. We're a movement seeking Jesus, serving others, keeping it real, embracing change, valuing all generations, keeping it simple, and giving because he gave to us. And that is what we want our church to be known, of, known for. Uh, would you guys stand with me? Some of you here this morning, you're like, man, that was a long list. I'm super bored, and that's fine. Um, but bottom line is we can't leave here without reiterating the fact that this is about Christ. And um, what a privilege we have to engage the living God. What a privilege we have to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. And as we leave here today, I pray that, that God's hand would be upon your life, that these cultural distinctives that we talked about would be things that you'd actually put to action in your life, that you would desire to live your life the way that Jesus lived his, empowered by the power and the authority of the Most High God to move through you however he asks, whenever he asks, wherever he asks. Will you pray with me? Christ, we uh, come before you, and God, I think most of us realize how desperate we are for just a renewal in our hearts. God, for a fresh move of God in our city, for something, God, that is not built on man and things and programs and events, but something that is just built on the word of God, whose foundation is Jesus, who desires to see Jesus move in and through his church, to equip his church for the work of ministry. And I pray, God, that this morning, if there's those of us uh, in this room that are just feeling spiritually dead, God, I pray as they call out to you this morning, that you bring renewal. God, for those in this room that maybe have been searching for all kinds of programs and things that they need to get involved in in order to try to sort of earn their spirituality, their walk with you, Jesus, I pray that you just kill that in their mind and that they would be content with just Jesus, with your word. God, would you raise up a church that would profess you as the core of everything they do? We know that we're not perfect, God but we know that you are perfect in us. And we pray that you'd use these imperfect lives, these shells that you've given us to bring much glory, much praise, and much honor and worship to your name. God, that those around us, the culture that we're surrounded by, would be influenced by those in this room that just choose Jesus. God, affect lives for eternity in our community. Raise up a people in Cooney County even that would unashamedly chase after Jesus with all they have.
that would give you their lives, Jesus, that would be empowered by you, that would not take the reins into their own hands to try to make things happen on their own, but trust you with their life, Jesus, and trust that you are the one that will move uh, through them how you want, when you want, where you want. We love you, Jesus, in your name.